I hope we can uh, make this as fun a panel as possible and perhaps a little bit controversial, but let me just start with something that seems pretty basic, which is um, to set the stage and try to dial in on the precision of our discussion, uh, because as we all know, and in part because of your papers, um, you know, we, we've contemplated m multiple different definitions of momentum since its antecedents. Uh, how do you each define momentum to softball? Why don't we start with Toby? Um, so I think, well, the, the classic definition that, that, first of all, thanks for including me on the panel, and I'm happy to be here with my distinguished panelists as well, and thanks everybody for, for coming. Um, you know, I think the classic definition of momentum, the way Jagadish and Tipton defined it, was this relative strength uh, type of strategy. So in the cross section, stocks that, or any asset really, that does better than its peers over some prior period of time, uh, tends to predict relative performance in the future. And it's really that relative concept. So it doesn't matter if the market's up or down, it's on a relative basis. There is, of course, a time series momentum component as well that um, I've worked on and others have worked on, which is much more about you know, autocorrelation and returns through time. And there's some relation between that. That's maybe something we can talk about later. But So I would define momentum as generally covering those, those two main aspects. Okay, good. Uh, let, now let's go down the line uh, with an understanding that... Um there are multiple characteristics that define it, Ken? Yeah, so um, I guess I'd put it in the context of the broader set of patterns that we see exhibited in stock returns. So um, what we know is, um, there was a little bit of a discussion of this in the, in the first paper in particular, that over a very short horizon, we see uh, a short-term reversal effect, um, which actually Jagadish worked on. I think he's one of the first ones to work on this in his 1990 paper. Uh, and this appears to be um, kind of uh, a liquidity effect, i.e. when you see price moves that aren't accompanied by any information, you see those moves reverse over about the next two weeks to a month. Um, and then uh, from about one month out to about a year, um, depending on who you talk to and which per paper you read, you're gonna get different answers, but uh, it looks like uh, past shocks in a given direction, there appears to be either what's underreaction or continuing overreaction, which means that you get some price continuation. So what went up um, uh, a month ago is gonna keep going up for the next kind of two to, uh, six to 12 months. And then eventually there is some longer term reversal, which it can be called either long term reversal uh, and I think the same phenomena seems to drive the value effect. And um, so momentum is kind of the middle, the middle horizon phenomena. Okay, all right. Over to you, Mark. It doesn't leave very much for me to explain, does it? <laughs> <laughs> well, but as an academic, I always use 212. Momentum is 212. It's, uh, you know, what, you lag a month and 11 month return. But as an asset manager, um, I think of momentum as any predictability where you're buying assets that are going up and selling assets that are going down. Could be because of past prices or could be almost any other piece of information where on average you're buying things that are going up and selling things that are going down. And in that, using that nomenclature, it's a much broader group of, of um, predictabilities and uh, they, they're broader than what you guys would think of, but they actually have a lot of commonalities. And in what we do, you know, that momentum concept makes a lot more sense than just focusing on 212. Well, so then let me start this way and go back, and then we'll, we'll, we'll start jumping in. So uh, that begs the question of whether uh, momentum is a risk factor, in part because it's persistent uh, out of sample, going backward in time. It's persistent across asset classes. Uh, is persistent and uh, survives um, multiple comparison, you know, uh, uh, Bernoulli-oriented uh, confidence intervals, and, and it really is this uh, sort of very strong feature. The spread between high-low momentum and stocks is often thought to be stronger than the spread between stocks and bonds. So, Mark, is it a risk factor? We're all knowing that there is the famous Carhartt factor. Uh, is it a risk factor? The honest truth is I kind of don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't. Well, I think... I, I live now in the asset management world. To me, uh, factors are interesting. Well, what's interesting to me as an investor is are there predictabilities in returns that we can use to improve performance? And then secondly, are, are there 
are there ways to do performance evaluation to better explain manager performance and distinguish between luck and skill? That, those are the interesting applications. Whether it's a price risk factor, you know, I spent a lot of time in that literature back in the day, mostly as a student and partially as a participant. But I kind of, and even like think about the discussion we've had already today, like what's the difference between a factor and alpha, right? I, I'm not sure that, I, I don't know the answer to that question, and so I don't, I kind of don't care. I do think that it's a persistent phenomenon. You see it everywhere all the time, and it's, uh, it, it's either not arbitrageable because it's risk or because people are just persistently stupid. It just, okay. It's persistent. Okay, so, so we have to care in some sense from a practitioner view as well as an academic view because the price that investors pay for beta versus alpha or something in between are vastly different, right? We can pay 15 bips for some form of momentum or we could pay, you know, two and 20. Uh, so it matters in the world at large. Uh, um, and and but, so let me go, so thank you and let me go to Kent. Um, uh, don't we care so about it because of that? So you said we're supposed to be controversial and aggressive? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to say it's a dumb question. Is that okay? <laughs> I'd like to thank our panelists, Mark Carhart and Tony Blaskowitz. Thank you for being here. <laughs> so, um, or I'm trying to think, you know, Gene probably, we were talking about Fama earlier, who all, yeah. we all interacted with closely, have interacted with closely over many years. Of course, yeah. And I think what Gene maybe would say is, well, it's certainly a risk factor for somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And I think thinking about a representative agent model and asking for the representative agent in the economy is momentum a risk factor? I'm not sure that's really the right question because I think I'm not sure I trust that kind of model so much anymore. I mean, certainly if you ask, uh, is it the covariance of momentum returns with marginal utility for the average investor and economy that drives its performance, the premium it earns, I would say the answer is probably no, right? But I think it might very well be the case that, like for Mark and Toby, maybe not for me so much anymore, it's probably a risk factor, because probably if momentum does badly, you guys are gonna be unhappy, right? Is that fair? Yeah. So for them, it's a risk factor, right? <laughs> so, um, the, um, now, you know, it is, does everybody in the economy have the right exposure to momentum? Probably not, right? Um, my sense is that probably people in the economy, I mean, certainly assuming the return patterns we've seen historically continue, should they have a little bit more exposure to momentum if they're really optimizing? Yeah, right? So in that sense, it's probably not a risk factor. Sorry I said, by the way, your question. Was no, no, I'm going to call, call you for the rest of the panel. That's, uh, <laughs> it's been a while since I'm called the dean, but I'm going to do it. Uh, well, so let, let, me, let me do one follow-up, okay? Give me one shot, but there'll be more. Um, so so, so <laughs> the question will ultimately be about the state variable then, right? But here's the thing. It's so persistent. This has been on SS Ron. Jagadish and Titman did their amazing work. It, it works out of sample in all kinds of directions. How can it be... Um, a persistent source of returns. What is the friction that you must have behind this? And it's okay. It's, it's too easy to say people are stupid. Uh, that might be the case, yeah. but I mean, you have to have a, you know, having no model is, is in a sense a kind of vacant model. So the question then comes back: um, How can it live as an alpha? And what's the constraint? Your work, some of the work that we've done uh, a while ago, points out that short sales constraints aren't big binding. Constraints. What is driving? What's the constraint? You get what's the constraint? You get so what, what's the state variable? <laughs> So, well, uh, this is maybe the first time I appear nicer than Kent. I'm going to say it's the wrong, it's the wrong question. Yeah, the, but yeah, I think I think Kent's right. It's it's it, you know thinking. About, I think trying to find the the right state variable for what's driving the premium to momentum. I, I don't think has proved very useful. I think that you know if you want to claim it's a it's picking up some source of systematic risk. It's more about using past returns that picks up some latent factor that we don't know yet what it is. I'm not even sure that's true because it's such a fast moving factor. But to answer your question, why hasn't been, it's not easy to arbitrage away. All three of us have lived through multiple momentum crashes. They're painful. They, they cause, they're rare. They're, rare. Uh, they're deep. They cause people to give up, which is exactly <laughs> what, you, what, you, what you need if you're going to stay in it. Um, so, you know, being able to weather that storm, um, 
you know, it's certainly a risk to somebody. It's been the, a yeah. risk to the three of us, for sure, at different times in, in yeah. our lives. Um, and, and because of that, I think it's very hard to keep those positions. So, you know, as, as many people in this room know, even if you're convinced and convicted to it, your clients aren't. And it's not easy to maintain those positions. So I think the limits to arbitrage is really the right argument for a lot of these, particularly momentum. Um, it's mm. got some vault to it and a lot of skewness. A lot of all, a lot of skewness. Left tail skewness, rare. Left, yeah, the wrong rare, side of the skewness. Rare, <laughs> rare, rare, rare crash. Uh, okay, well then, Mark, back to you. Uh, and, and, and you, pretty much on the panel. Um, what about T cost? And is it, is it investable? Is the car factor investable? Yep. Momentum is investable, absolutely, um, at the margin. Um, but there's a material loss, you know, over the gross returns we're used to seeing, which is one of the reasons I, I mentioned. A really interesting application of, of momentum is explaining investor performance. And I did that in my dissertation, like explaining mutual fund And what you found was these mutual funds underperformed the model pretty consistent, particularly the, the momentum factor. And, but that was assuming that you could trade for no cost. And you put in a little you know, friction for that, it sort of goes away. So yeah, there's no question it's hard to do. It's not that it can't be done, um, but there are places where it's easier, right? Futures. Anytime you can trade a portfolio, like an ETF, you sort of get a reduction in transactions costs. You can pick up momentum that way. But it can be done. Um, and certainly, you know, at the margin, including it as a signal, it makes a lot of sense. But it, it's not as easy as it appears from the academic literature. Right. So, so you, have, you have to map it. You have to humble the premium. There are all kinds yep. of things yep. you have to do, uh, do, 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 do in, the, in the center of it. Um, so then, uh, Kent, what's the leading, if you, if you don't have a traditional APT style model in mind, which I'm presuming you don't, right? What is the model? And not having a model, I mean, it's hard to get off the stage if we don't say something about having a model somehow, right? Kent doesn't have it. The, mo I, the, mo the model being no model is, I, is I have, a challenge. I have multiple models that are <laughs> right. completely different, right? right. Uh, yeah. So I think there are, again, there are a bunch of stories out there. Um, so, you know, I have an old paper with Hirschleifer and Subramanium mm -hmm. yeah. that, um, that argued that there's um, some uh, overreaction, or continuing overreaction. Um, I, I have a, kind of a, a, a new paper with two guys, Alex Close and Simon Rotka, and there we have a, uh, a multiple investor model which I think what we're exploring is short sale contrained securities. And it turns out, you know, one of the things that we really see in financial markets is a huge amount of disagreement. Mm -hmm. This is, again, part of what, you know, leads me to want to move away from representative agent models. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking more and more with more of the evidence that I see, I'm inclined to believe that there's some tendency on the part of investors to not do a very good job of extracting information from prices. In other words, prices move up, and you know, if you see this, I mean, I find myself doing this. A price moves up and you think, look at the way the price has moved up. These guys are idiots, right? And at least some fraction of the time, what you know is there's gonna be some information there. Mm -hmm. And until you start seeing snippets of that information actually reach you, you know, via reading news feeds or whatever, you're not gonna trust that that information is really there. So as, you know, to the extent there's some in agent out there, or some group of agents that have private information, they push the price up, uh, investors look around and say, I don't trust this. But then as more and more information is revealed consistent with that price rise, the price continues to increase. My sense is that that might be a lot of what's driving momentum. But again, there, there are a lot of different explanations. And, and not short sales constraints. What, what, you know, how do you assign them? Yeah, no, I, it, in fact, um, my argument would be for short sale constrained stocks, you're gonna see patterns that are very, very different than what you see with standard moment, right? Right, okay. okay. What about other asset classes? Let's, let's hit that, uh, Toby. Uh, you've done work, uh, a lot of work on multiple asset classes and so on. What, 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 and, but, but, but momentum definitions are different in different asset classes in some ways. Is that a ro notion of robustness, uh, or does it pose additional questions, for example, about the explanation Kent just offered, including, by the way, apropos of your book, um, embedding markets? 
<laughs> right, so, well, a couple of things. I think in terms of robustness, if you just take the simple 212 price momentum, that works in many multiple asset classes. Currencies, commodities, fixed income. But you don't, um, need, the, you don't need the waiting period in some aspects. No, no, I mean, like, you know, in currencies, you don't need to skip a month, for instance, because they're highly liquid. But I'm saying if you just, if you literally take a uniform definition, you, you know, and you just apply it out of sample to all these other asset classes, it works very well. I find that interesting, and, and also another key point is those markets which typically aren't that correlated, they're more correlated when you look at momentum in those markets. So take a long, short momentum strategy in currencies and equities, that por those two portfolios would be more correlated than just you know, uh, random strategies in, the, in, either of those, in either of those asset classes. Which I think is interesting, because it says there's some correlation structure there. Um, but, but why, right? Well, that's the question, so why? Well, what I think is interesting is a lot of the theories that have been, and we've seen some of them today, that have been put forth for momentum, they're very equity-centric, right? So, um, and I think, you know, I think the behavioral stories could apply to other markets, but you're talking about different agents, right? The marginal investor in, say, government, uh, you know, I I uh, issued bonds or, or currencies is probably very different than what we think of as in individual stocks. Um, and then when you think about the risk-based stories, particularly things like you know some of these production or investment-based stories, they're, they're all about equities, right? I don't know how you apply that to say commodities or currencies where you see momentum patterns. So I think you know one of the things that, in my opinion, and I'm biased, is the field struggles with is finding uh, a set of theories for momentum that would apply across all these asset classes. And I'm also going to echo something that Mark said at the beginning, which I think was really important. These theories are often just about price momentum. There's a whole literature on what I would call fundamental-based momentum. Things like you know, earnings, we all know about inequities, but when you also go to other asset classes, there's lots of other signals that people use in practice and we've seen in the academic literature as well that are also correlated to price momentum strategies. It's not obvious how these theories, particularly the behavioral theories, mm -hmm. apply, apply to that, um, mm -hmm. right? You can tell stories about how people look at prices and, and update, but does that apply to other sort of fundamental signals as well? Maybe, mm -hmm. right? But I just don't think those have been written down so, yet. So information may not be tantamount across class the way that would apply for the market. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, you're, not, you're not getting paid for shocks in the same way. Perhaps, I, I, just, I just think it's an area that um, is sort of underexplored and, and I think could be interesting from a modeling perspective and then hopefully that launches a bunch of empirical implications. Okay, all right. This is just a start. We're just getting more of it. This is our Zumba. Uh, now we're out to the burn. Uh, off to you guys. Uh, uh, when you're ready, uh, raise your hand uh, if you have a question for the panel or a comment to make. Uh, there are folks in the room or in the audience who have contributed to the literature and who have been putting this into practice alike. So let us uh, uh, turn it over uh, to you. Questions? We'll start over here. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you for, um, for the panelists to share their insights. Um, Maybe this is a little bit of a reflection of having spent too much time on the sell side now as opposed to the buy side and, you know, dealing with people who may not always be, be thinking about factors as deeply as asset managers. But I, I think momentum is probably a, even though you can reasonably easily define it, it's a very poorly understood factor. And so people throw it in the same bucket as value, growth, you know, momentum is there. But if you think about momentum by definition, um, can get very highly correlated with other factors. And we've seen this obviously with, you know, the whole growth capital. Um, and so when, when you talk to people, just the notion that um, a constituents of what looks like a momentum basket can actually change overnight as opposed to when you talk about value stocks or growth stocks, they tend to be more persistent. Um, I don't think they always think through the repercussions on that. So actually two questions here. Um, number one, have any of you kind of looked closely at, is there a difference in behavior of momentum depending on how closely it starts to become correlated with other factors and does that have repercussions? And then secondly, um, the fact that it can very quickly turn around, is that just underscoring there has to be some premium here because um, it, it is some reflection of the fact that timing the market is incredibly difficult. So with a momentum factor, we can start to, you know, bubble, bubble, and people can say this is really overpriced at some point. Um, it is going to turn around, but timing that is very difficult. 
And is that a little bit the embedded premium? So first one's conditional exposure, second one is timing. I'd like to, to run to you, Martin. Worth? I mean, I, I would just say that the point that uh, Ingrid makes about the correlation is really important and it's understood, I think, by asset managers, right? If you're, whatever your factor is that has persistent positions is doing well consistently, then that portfolio also is a momentum portfolio. And so you get that, that correlation. And, and so when you get more exposure, you have, you're spreading your risk across multiple factors. You have you know, more correlation and a correlated factor at that moment in time. Um, yes, we've done a lot of work on timing momentum. A lot of stuff on dynamics. And honestly, you know, most of the research that we're talking about, that what was, what's been done in academics and what we're talking about is in equities, there's a tremendous amount of other predictabilities, which you referenced in other markets, where the momentums are different horizon, where they're more dynamic. And to me, that's where the interesting research is going. It's really about a generic form of underreaction, which is dynamic, which changes through time. And you have to estimate what that is and, and try to figure out how to, to be in front of that or at least be caught up to where it is. It is not a singular estimate. So that's, I think, where what's interesting about um, uh, investing in momentum today. Yeah, if I'll, I'll jump in. Um, the, uh, you know, Toby is in my paper from years ago now, uh, the momentum crash this paper, paper explored this, and in fact, in a lot of different asset classes. The idea is really, really simple. Like, you know, if you, if the, um, the market is, momentum is basically you're buying winners and you're selling losers, right? And so if the market has been going up, uh, momentum is going to have a positive beta relative to the market. If certain uh, kinds of securities have been going up. Momentum is going to have a positive exposure to those. And this is true. This is true for equities, but it's also true for other asset classes. So to the extent, you know, the market goes up and then it goes down for a while. Well, when the market is going down, um, you're going to have the beta is clearly going to change. It's going to re kind of flip relative to, yeah, it's going to flip. So um, eventually. What's that? Eventually. Eventually. And uh, so but you can hedge out that kind of stuff a little bit, right? And that helps improve your performance, kind of related to the second paper today. There are lots of risks that you can hedge out, and the performance uh, remains, uh, remains good after doing that. Uh, and in fact, you can improve the performance pretty dramatically by hedging out these kind of unintended risk factors. Um, yeah, I was, I was saying something, something similar. Uh, I mean, actually, back to your question about, you know, is it risk? Um, it's so painful living through these momentum crashes. Kent and I wrote a paper about it. It was, you know, called therapy. Um, but, uh, it's called therapy. Uh, I but, understand why dealing with Kent, you'd have to get some therapy. Yeah, it helped, actually. No. But we learned, we learned a lot. For, you know, I, I think it's this, this old point that uh, Grundy and Martin made, and before them, uh, Kothari and Shankin, in a different mm. uh, context, mm. which is when you're ranking on past performance of any kind, when you go through a bad period, right, you're going to be long the stuff that had low, low betas with respect to that factor and short the stuff that had high betas or flipped around if, if things were going well, whichever factors did well during that time. You're going to have this dynamic beta exposure. With momentum in particular, it moves very fast to sort of get to your, your question. Um, and so it's related to everything that Mark and, and, and Kent said. And it is true you can hedge it out. It, you don't hedge it out for free. It's very, very costly. I mean, in, in our paper, um, you know, we, we had a dynamic strategy that hedged out that exposure and it, it very much improved the sharp ratio, I think by maybe 50%, it was quite, quite good. And Kent has other work where he purges uh, exposure from lots of different factors from, you know, uh, from the uh, covariance matrix. But doing that in real time with, with transactions costs, it requires an awful lot of trading and it, it may not be worth it. You, at least uh, in my experience, it's, it's it, the T costs pretty much wipe out the additional benefit you get from that dynamic exposure because it is a very fast moving thing. And that may be the risk, right? That may be if you're willing to, to bear that risk of those conditional factor exposures, you do get paid on average to do that. That's the one sense in which maybe there's something, you know, that's maybe the, where the risk is coming from. That's not really an explanation for momentum. Right, it's a, it's a, it's a partial correlate, maybe a partial explanation. So Why it doesn't go away, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right, good. Questions, go right in the front up here. Thanks. Um, uh, Rob Cullery of AIC Friendly Office. Um, this might be led up by the uh, AQR uh, representative. 
Uh, but uh, I was curious if the panel could speak a little bit about uh, limited partner and investor preferences now. Are you seeing you know, institutions or, or foundations or, or high net worth kind of either changing their mix or uh, ha having other preferences to, uh, to their holds here? Let's also clarify. I mean, the question is, do you see preferences about uh, momentum-oriented strategies from LPs, uh, including, you know, uh, in the cross-section and across time? Um, you know, I, I, I don't really have a good answer to that question because, I, I, you, know, you know, on the research side, I don't really see a lot of that. Uh, it would be something I'd probably I'd have to ask my colleagues. But generally, I mean, I think, you know, factors come in and out of favor depending on their past performance is typically what you, what you see. Um, that would be my first order effect. But uh, right now, I, 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 don't, I don't know that I haven't heard anything dramatic one way or the other. So, but um, really not, not too well informed. Okay. Well, in, in the trend space, Right, that's a form of momentum. Right? Oh, time series, that's right. true. That, that stuff we, is, yeah. you know, there had been a huge inflow of capital after the financial crisis, um, and it had, I think, peak performance at the end of 2014, and it had like seven flat years, flat to down years, and there were definitely were outflows. You could see it in the data very clearly. The assets dropped. They, they, they didn't drop by two thirds, but you saw outflows. And um, of course, the last year has been very good uh, and for, for momentum, for, for trend in particular. Had a really strong uh, performance this year with currencies and commodities. And so there's increasing interest. Again, let's come back to what drives momentum. I don't know for sure, but I do know investors look at one year past return <laughs> <laughs> and interest in trend because performance has been really strong is definitely affecting investor preferences now. Right. So that, that's that's partially to a model, maybe not very far. It's a it's a it's a state space comment. Yes. Uh, it's nice to be long convex strategies and momentum or trend during periods of inflation. An empirical observation on a model. Um, okay. All right. Excellent. Uh, questions. Let's go right here, and then we'll go over. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't want to sound too simplistic, but you know we're talking about momentum. We're talking about what moves markets. I haven't heard anyone mention the Federal Reserve or central banks. I mean, that's one of the biggest momentum movers. Look, you've had through 2020 when the Fed started easing, and I could go back 30 years, but, you know, when they started easing, the markets just went up. It, it, you know, it raised all boats, and it went all the way through 21. Now that the Fed is tightening, and when I say tightening, not only do they, they raise 225 basis points and another 75 on Tuesday, so that's 300 this year, which is pretty quick. You have over 500 other rate rises from other central banks throughout the world. And not only is it the rates that have been rising, you, you just went from quantitative easing, where they provided liquidity for a whole bunch of years, to quantitative tightening. So if you're talking about momentum, I haven't heard anyone mention central banks. Maybe it's a naivete because you're, you're trying to, to outperform other equities. But if you're talking about momentum, I don't understand why we're not hearing anything yeah, about central banks and what the Fed is doing. Or the Fed in our case and other central banks. Yes, it's really a, a question from two angles. One is what about the, the Fed factor uh, by itself and also sort of how do you disentangle factors in a sense if you take a, a model approach. Yeah, okay. I would, I would let you take that one. You guys, you guys You're going to punt it. Mark is calling. Well, somebody. you've done you've done great work. AQR has done good work on macro momentum. So, yeah, I would say. Look, you know, Mark sort of alluded to this earlier. I think when you're talking about, um, you know, uh, macro events like 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 the Fed, like like monetary policy, uh, that's going to affect, I think, things like trends, right? Clearly, uh, that could be trends in equities. Certainly, trends in fixed income, commodities for sure. When you when you talk about inflationary environments. Um, now, that has less to do, I think, with what, you know, if you think about Jagadish and Tipman's uh, classic uh, measure of momentum, it's relative strength. It's about equities versus equities. And you said that. It's not going to have much of an effect there unless you think there's, you know, a different duration effect on the equities. But that, that's, that's tiny. Um, that's going to be very small. So I think to your point, yeah, I think the Fed can have some influence on trends um, at a macro level and macro type momentum to, uh, strategies. Um, but so will, so will other global you know, macro factors for sure. And, and I would think interest rates would, would certainly be a big part of that. Um, this is tangentially related to this, but it's kind of an interesting factoid. So I'll throw it out there anyway. One of the things that I've been doing a little bit of work on is meme stock, like GameStop, right? And um, 
probably as everybody knows, there was, if you look at GameStop pre, uh, what, January, February 2021, uh, it was declining rapidly. It got down below $3 a share. There was an incredible amount of short interest. Uh, short interest was over 100%. Borrow costs were up around 100% per year. Uh, and it was trading at $3. And then with the whole um, uh, Reddit, uh, what, Wall Street bets forum, uh, the noise that was injected into this. And actually, there's a guy, uh, Robin Greenwood and some of his authors have an interesting paper that suggests that a lot of the stimulus money flowed into buying GameStop. Um, the GameStop jumped up to, I think it hit a high of $448 uh, a few months later. And if you look at what happened to uh, short interest and to borrow costs for GameStop, they both went close to zero. So basically the shorts gave up. And then interestingly, for from like March 2021 up through the start of this year, short interest stayed very, very low and borrow costs stayed at zero. And then when the market started going down at the start of this year, both of those jumped up dramatically. So it kind of looked like there were the investors who were in there who were willing to short sell GameStop held off until there was a little bit of momentum in the market, it looks like. This is my interpretation of that. I don't know if that's right, but... Um, and, and did the specialness go as high as it was before? Probably not. Right? Got up not to... Even close. Uh, got up to 120% in advance borrow of cost. Mm -hmm. uh, well, kind of in, in March of uh, 2022, so a few months. Ago. Okay. All it's right. come down a little bit again, but it's still very high. Still constrained. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, over here, we had a, a question. Um, yes, hi. So this is just about equities, and I'm slightly following Ingrid's question. Um, if we think about value, growth, quality, you can come up with plausible economic rationales as to why those might um, offer a risk premium on average over time. I'm not aware of any such economic rationale for momentum. And there was a paper published a few years ago, and I believe it was called uh, Momentum Factor or Factor Momentum, or it might have been the other way around, which was arguing that um, actually what was going on was that there was no momentum factor as such, but every now and then, for example, value stocks would do very well, and then people would sort of notice they were doing very well, and they'd latch onto them, and that kind of was actually a momentum effect. And then another time, maybe quality stocks were doing very well, and people noticed that, and they latched onto them, and there you go, now momentum takes on a kind of a quality aspect. And the hypothesis of the paper was that there wasn't actually any such thing as a real momentum factor, it was just other style factors performing well over a period and people latching onto them. I was wondering if the panel would care to comment on that. Thank you. I, I can, well, I, I, I was going to say, I would disagree with one thing you said and, and agree with the latter part you said. I actually think the hardest factor to explain is quality, more, even more so than momentum. Mm -hmm. You're talking about highly profitable stocks that have low risk and yet they have uh, high expected returns, right? We would think of them as having high prices, not low prices. I find that one the, the toughest one to explain from a from an academic perspective, but nevertheless, I think the the the, um, the stuff you mentioned on factor momentum and or is momentum a factor? There is some debate going on about that, and I think that research is interesting. In fact, Brian Kelly and I have, have worked a little bit on that as well. Um, I think you know it's probably it matters. I think for the story because a lot of the stories, it, it, even in equities, are really about thinking of this at the individual stock level and coming up with people trying to infer information, either underreacting or you know, delayed overreacting to that information. Whereas another interpretation is all it's really doing is picking up these latent factor exposures as things are, are turning around and you're, like you said, picking up the factors that are doing well over this time. So, which is also what explains the dynamic uh, uh, correlation it has with other factors. Um, and I think, I think that debate's still ongoing. Now, I think if you're running money, uh, and Mark may disagree with this, maybe you don't care. Maybe you're picking up just that, that, that piece that seems to be there in markets. Um, but I think, that's, I think it's interesting. And I don't, my opinion, reading that literature is not fully sorted out yet. I don't, I don't believe it's all coming from just factors. Um, and the reason I say that is that you see it, it we'll go outside of equities for a second, but Chris mentioned some of my work on sports betting. There you're looking at contract by contract. You do see systematic underreaction to, or in that case, it's overreaction to information 
on specific contracts, which would be consistent with some of the explanations for momentum. Of course, you could say sports betters are totally different than investors. Uh, my experience is they, you know, they, the Venn diagram there, there's a huge area where, uh, where they overlap. Um, but, um, but so I think, it's, I think it's an interesting question and one that uh, my guess is research will continue to explore. Who knows, maybe the money supply went into the racetrack. And that's why velocity is still low. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me take issue with the premise. Of, I guess I'm not convinced um, with, the, uh, with the idea that you know, there's no plausible story for momentum. I think there, there might be a lot of plausible stories for momentum, which is maybe why we disagree about this. But um, I think to argue, you know, there, that I think we can explain. I think there may be a number of possible ways we can potentially explain momentum. And we're at the stage now where we're trying to sort out which of these is actually correct. And, um, but I definitely wouldn't go so far as to say, you know, there's no way we can possibly explain momentum. I mean, I'm a behavioral person. You know, with behavioral stories, you can explain anything, believe me. So. Got <laughs> <laughs> that on tape. Um, well, so there's, there's, a, there's a behavioral model somewhere in there. It's just uh, it's diffuse across. Yeah, and I, actually, I'm becoming more and more. I, I mentioned this at the beginning, but we talked a little bit about you know the Raven O'Donoghue idea of firstness, right? That people tend to ignore information that's not directly presented to them. And I think there's there's so much behavioral evidence that we all behave like that. And you like, know, this like, should like information cascade, like Eva Wells' information cascade. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a little different, but, but related, right? Very much so. And, um, you know, I think it's very plausible that, that, that these sorts of biases should affect asset prices. And are, we know they're going to lead to momentum-like phenomena. And they should lead to momentum-like phenomena in lots and lots of different asset markets, which is very, yeah. you know, like Toby's work and other work. So. Yeah, okay. All right. I, Mark, I would go further and say, I'm not sure I buy the stories on any factor. Yeah. They're always ex post. They're always ex post. Yeah. And I don't, it gives us comfort because you've got a good story afterwards. I mean, think of how much research was done on the small cap effect. And we all, we all understood the small cap effect. But that's what's not there anymore. That's, right. that's what's special about and the I, in a way. I don't think we yeah, have a good it, explanation. As Toby for said, I'm value. not sure it ever was. You're right. I'm not sure it was ever. It, it, it never was. <laughs> I know. I'm just pointing out that there was a whole literature where people felt like, oh, we understand why the small stock effect is there. Yeah. And same with value, we've tried to do that. I just don't, I don't think any of these stories are, are accurate or relevant. What we care about is, is that fact robust? Is it gonna work in the future? Yeah. That's an empirical question to me. And I think there are much better ways to address it than a story. Okay, then the, 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 the obvious question, which is what br brought you to uh, add the momentum factor to the Fama French three-factor model? <laughs> and I, I bet almost everyone in the room has run a, a four-factor model regression at some point. I think the Carhartt model actually showed up at one of our under, uh, MBA or undergraduate uh, speeches at Wharton one year where they referenced it. So I don't know if that is You probably know what they're talking about. Yeah, so what, what motivated that? Is that just a, well, I mean, isn't every model that, we, that is based on, based on empirics I mean, backward looking. I mean, come on. I mean, this is this is just research, right? So, okay. So, the the context for me adding the fourth factor to the Fama and French model was I was a PhD student, where Kent was one of my advisors at Chicago when a lot of this research was going on. You know, uh, Jagadish's paper and Jagadish and Timmish's paper were, were out there. Um, we discussed, you know, at seminars, and at the same time, there was a really um, my my research was in uh, explaining mutual fund performance. I built the uh, CRISP survivor bias free mutual fund database. And there was a paper by Zeckhauser, um, which found that there was a hot hand in mutual fund performance, that one year past return. Um, and it just seemed to me that that probably is more likely a momentum effect in stock returns than mutual fund um, managers have a hot hand and then they lose it. And so that. There's, okay, well, let's see if we can just add that factor. But a very simple idea. I just, and you know, if anyone who's actually seen the research, you'll see that my factor is like a really poorly done <laughs> 212. There was no value weighting. I didn't try to, like Fom and French, do a interleaving across, you know, value, small cap, and everything. I would just put something very simple in there. And it just worked very well to explain a lot of the mutual fund performance. So that's why I did it. 
And it turns out that momentum was related to so many of the anomalies sort of, sort of caught on. I think people have done it much better than I have since. And they, they changed the name, thankfully, because I called it PR one year, which was really boring. Yeah. <laughs> MOM seems more actual. Yeah, it also uh, gave rise to the 30-40-30 idea uh, in sorting, right? I mean, that was one of the, uh, right. sure everyone here has probably done something right. like that as well. That's kind of amazing. Yeah. You're responsible for 30-40-30. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. I apologize. <laughs> but at least it's robust. <laughs> Naive and robustness are often the same thing, right? So yeah. I think that's good. Oh, interesting story. Uh, part of our history. So let's take it this way. <clears throat> Another element of momentum is the, the waiting period in, in equities anyway. Uh, and short-term reversals. Um, is that also modelless? Uh, is it a part of a spectrum? Is there a time series of reversion and persistence that needs to be part of a model? And a model could be a correlation, and we can say behavioral finance, finance, finance. So, but I mean, wh how, how do you link together long-term, <coughs> excuse me, long-term mean reversion, intermediate-term momentum, and then short-term reversion in a consistent way? Well, I mean, that's, that's always been the, the challenge. I mean, Kent did some of the earliest work on a, on a model that tried to do that, right? And that's, I think, what was great about those, those models, along with Nick Barbera and, and, and um, uh, Hong and Stein, too. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's always been the challenge. I think, the, I think as, as Kent, I think Kent said this earlier, the short-term reversal, I think, has always been thought of as just a liquidity phenomenon. And I, I think that's probably right. Um, you know, it's one week, yeah. one month reversals have gotten weaker over time. They're now sort of one week reversals. Um, yeah, I think that's probably right, uh, and that's true in equities. And then merging, you know, sort of marrying the intermediate horizon momentum with these long-term reversals, um, I think there is, uh, correct, uh, you guys may have a different opinion, but um, there is some debate on whether those two things are linked <laughs> or, whether, or whether they're different. I mean, we sort of interpret them as, the same stock kind of goes up relative to its peers and then it also comes down. I'm not sure that there's a lot of strong evidence for that as opposed to just on average we see stuff over this horizon go up and, and, and the other stuff come down. It is, we know the long-term reversals are tied to the value effect. We know the value effect is negatively correlated to the momentum effect and combining them makes for a more powerful portfolio. I'm not sure we understand that whole system yet. So some of the leading explanations are more about this diffusion of information and how people react to it. Um, I think a risk story probably does have a tougher time explaining both of those facts, um, unless you, know, you have to you have to um, buy into some sort of time varying risk there. Possible for sure, but I think that that's a bit harder. But those are those are my thoughts. I don't think we've resolved that one. Yeah. Um, so the uh, I would completely agree with Toby on the one month reversal. I mean, I think probably of all the stuff out there, that's the one we understand the best. Because it really looks like, um, you know, stuff that has gone up and where it's the movement upward or, or downward, right, can't be explained by anything else. Can't be explained by industry factors, can't be explained by news, right? This is basically pull all the stuff out that helps to explain this. And then look at the residual. The residual reverses and nothing else reverses. In fact, if anything, there's a slight amount of continuation for everything else. So it really looks like when stuff goes up for absolutely no reason, at least historically, there weren't, you can either think of them as liquidity providers or opportunistic traders who pushed it back down to where it should have been. Historically, that wasn't there. Now you look, you know, in the last 20 years, this, is, this amount of reversal has fallen almost to zero, kind of as trading became so much, uh, as the frictions for trading fell, right? Where it gets more complicated is in terms of the, the medium term and the longer term. Um, I mean, uh, in, in terms of where we're going here in terms of the research, I think that what we're going to be doing is trying to dig more into the questions like Toby talked about. You know, is this, uh, you know, the way, I know there was a plot in uh, David and Supra's and my paper where we viewed this as an impulse response because it was very much a representative investor model. So is this really what's going on? And I think now we realize the situation is a lot more complicated. Um, you alluded earlier to, you know, I've done some work on uh, a short constrained stock, right? And so what we see for those is, you know, you find the stocks that have gone way, way up and they're short constrained, meaning they're hard to borrow. Well, what do you see? What we find is there is zero momentum. In other words, they immediately start reversing, right? So We're conditional, at, conditional on specialness or something like that. Conditional so conditional on, on specialness, exactly. So what we do specifically, because we need a long time series, we don't actually have the borrow cost data. 
All the where we have borrow cost data since 2004, it's consistent with this, but the results I'm gonna talk about are for a horizon from the 80s up till today. And what we do is we look for stocks that have low institutional ownership. Mm. Why low institutional ownership? Because institutions lend out their share, mm -hmm. right? And they have high uh, shortage. Mm -hmm. So it's most likely that they were constrained, but that's our proxy theory. So what you see is that stocks that have gone way up tend to immediately start coming down and go down for a long time. In fact, they keep going down, keep falling for five years. It's yeah. a little bit different though. I mean, I mean short, high short interest stocks not displaying momentum is not necessarily logically the same thing as saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of low momentum stocks display uh, high specialness or something like that, right? I mean, it's not. The converse know. doesn't hold, right, right for gotcha. sure. Gotcha, right? gotcha. So but, it's, a, it's a best of partial explanation. Uh, uh, oh, for sure. Well, yeah. let me tell you. So the other part of this, though, is that short constrained stocks that have experienced severe negative return exhibit a huge amount of momentum. So they f keep falling for about a year and then flat out. So what we argue is going on, some of you are probably familiar with the Miller 77 mm -hmm. paper, sure. which is this beautiful paper. I remember talking to Jeremy Stein about 30 years ago, because this, this paper was published in the JF and got no attention for 20 years. Yeah. And now a whole bunch it, it of us. It should be a must read. It should be a must read. Yeah, that's right. And the basic idea is really simple. Um, if a stock is hard to borrow, what's going to happen is, so what does that mean? You basically, you have to pay money to short it. So what's going to happen? Well, you're going to have a bunch of, to the extent there's disagreement about the prospects of this security, which we think is typically the case, right? Typically, there are people who think it's a really good buy, and there are people who think it's, a lot, it's way overpriced, right? And um, what's gonna happen is through the aggregation that takes place in securities market, you'll get a price that equals about the average valuation. Well, when it's hard to borrow, when for institutional reasons, you just, you, you, know, you can't short this stock, what's gonna happen is the price is gonna reflect the beliefs of the optimum. So this is what we think is going on with these short constrained stock, is that for the past winners, you're seeing the beliefs of the optimist, and for the past losers, you're seeing the beliefs of the optimist. So since we only get uh, momentum for the losers, we're saying, well, it's that group that is responsible for the momentum. So it's this group which, and by the way, what we diagnose is there's a group that underreacts, mm -hmm. and we argue it's because of inattention-like argument. In other words, uh, the price moves down. They don't know why it's moved down, right? for reasons like cursedness, they say, you know, I don't see any information that would be responsible for this price drop, right? So uh, I'm gonna so keep supporting the price and then the information that comes out that supports that price drop comes out and the price falls further, right? And, and you're finding bid-ask spread blow out because of a asymmetric information in the middle of that? Or in other so, words, in other words, you know, yeah, rent it, tech or something, you know, everyone in the audience is trying to arbit, but there's a price movement that is unknown, it's asymmetric. Someone yeah. recognizes it asymmetric yeah. and that's the constraint. So one thing that we see is we see really big borrow costs for these stocks over the period where we have borrow costs. So there's clearly a lot of disagreement, right? Yeah. Okay, all right. So, um, so anyway, I think using data like, going forward, right? Um, I, think, uh, I think it actually is, maybe I'm too much of an academic now, but my view is, you know, even for practitioners, if you can get a better handle on, you know, we build the model, we kind of start to try to start throwing data at it and see how well that model works and where it holds up. And that approach can perhaps lead to some better, better investment, right? And I think trying to look in unusual places like short constrained stocks, um, you know, I think that this kind of stuff that Vincent was presenting this morning is, is interesting on this dimension too, right? Really trying to throw unusual data at these models, trying to see where they work and where they don't is, is a really important uh, thing we should be doing for sure. forward. For sure. Okay. I, I would just quickly say short-term reversal, liquidity supply is probably the area that's generated the most success in asset manager of any any, yeah. any fact you can come up with. The investment banks, you've got you know, Medallion, you've got all the top StatArb firms, um, plenty of other firms that trade short frequencies. That's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's a real thing. We don't have to like, spend a lot of time questioning it. It's because of liquidity demand. Yeah. You get paid for that. Uh, it's hard to do because 
you know, you, you've got to be quick. You also have to be able to have low cost. You have to think about how to unwind these positions. And you've got firms that have built huge moats, you know, like Medallion that continues to generate sharp ratios that are, you know, multiples of three and continue to, uh, with, lots, with lots of capital. So it's a real thing. It's just unfortunate that we can't all do that. <laughs> and the moat, the moat is wide. Yes, the moat is big. Yeah. So we have to take on kind of residual risk. Yeah, I got you. Ray? Yeah, I got you. You had a chance to get uh, yeah, the, the question Yeah, the professor form. surprised me, but now I'm back. <laughs> so, uh, exactly. And I think this is one a little bit of a follow on what Kent just said and also maybe a tee up for Brian's paper coming up. So a lot of the, uh, the, the broad question is, do you guys think that the, that the what you should be doing now in momentum space is looking at nonlinearities and conditionals. So like some of the, like one of Brian's earlier papers employs machine learning and you see, I think you see that momentum factors have nonlinearities uh, attached. So I guess the question is, and also explaining like factor timing and things like that, conditionals seem to be valuable. So is the sort of state of the art, because 212 is just so, somewhat arbitrary, right? I mean, it, it picks up stuff but there's nothing magical about a linear, you know, set of returns in 212. So, you know, we're all trained to be simpler rather than more complex. There's going to be a paper talking about that later. But how do you guys feel about maybe one should use more nonlinear, conditional models taken out of the machine learning uh, types of toolboxes? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I would say from an academic perspective, we're we're obviously interested in simple measures that we try to explain and fit to a theory. But Ray, you're absolutely right. I think when you're talking about practicing this, and, and um, you know, uh, I think you you try to measure things as cleanly as you can, right? There's nothing special about 212. So using a mixture of different signals, we've talked about some, not just price-based measures of momentum, but others, different horizons. And then I think you're absolutely correct that some of the latest research is looking at you know nonlinear uh, connections between variables and and bringing in more data in a way that um, is efficient, right? like some of Brian's work that, that we're going to hear about. I think absolutely that stuff uh, can be valuable for predictability. Now, does it you know is it still the same phenomenon momentum? I say I would say it is. It's just a, a way of refining that measure, and it wouldn't just apply to momentum. Um, a lot of the work that people have done in the literature on, on machine learning has been to um, measure factors better by using all, all the machinery. So yeah, no, I think, I think that is a, a step forward. The, the, the horizon, is, is that the event horizon for momentum? Where is momentum going next? Will momentum continue? Of course, we suspect it will, uh, given all the out of sample evidence. Um, better data, better models, Make a statement, and a statement that's not—we we just can't have a model. We need a model, right? Again, you know, what, uh, what's on the edge? I, I really think it's back to dynamics. It's kind of what Ray was saying, um, and we've got, talked about it a little bit before. That you'll find that first, that's not consistency in horizon, in asset class, in uh, direction. I mean, obviously things change direction, but um, for all sorts of different assets, you can build uh, conditional on that moment in time, um, a dynamic model, all having that momentum idea that you're going to be buying things that are going up in price, but being more broad and thinking the, the space in which you could build such a model. Use machine learning techniques to thoughtfully do that. It'll naturally have nonlinearities in it. That will work a lot better. We've done it for, for many years at Capitalist. It's been very successful. Um, that to me is really where Mutual momentum is. It's that there is this underreaction. I call it underreaction. We can say what, what the driver is. It's there. It's robust. It's everywhere, and it's not consistent. So build a model which is dynamic. Um, that's how. That's how you'll be successful. Mm -hmm. and, and are you worried about auditability of the dynamics and understanding the models? I mean, I, know, I there are a lot less. of reasons to have models, and one is just to have the structure. ABC is on. I mean, it's it's a structure, right? The yeah, I think is so that, valuable. I think. Um, People overstate the complexity of these things. Like even like a neural network, we don't use neural networks. Most people say, oh, it's just inputs, outputs. Actually, no, it's actually a lot of transformations. And you can average across all the other outputs and say, well, what does, this, what does a functional form look like? You can actually see that and visualize the nonlinearities. It's more complicated. There are all sorts of methods and 
of random forests to figure out uh, importance and nonlinearity. So I, I think the interpretability is overrated, but even then you can get interpretability with all these nonlinear models as well. You just have to take the time to figure it out. Partially falling under the silo that you may not care. <laughs> yeah. In some sense, At the end of the day, what we care is about yeah. robustness. We right, right. Are we confident that we can predict a future return? A back test is not going to get us confident, by the way. Right. Right. You know, you got to have some true out of sample evidence to know whether it's going to work in the future. I'm not talking about building good back tests. I'm talking about using techniques that we feel we have confidence that will robustly work in the future. That's so really te techniques about. modification, not, not, not humbling the back test, but actually bring. Yeah. Okay. Not, not the, the, the Harvey Strong, Correct. the Strong stuff, but okay, all right, uh, Toby, and then uh, I'm reticent, but I'm going to give Kent the last word. Go ahead, Toby. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I would say, you know, w one thing I would say about, you know, I, I, look, uh, for sure, mo research is going to continue on momentum. It's one of our most robust factors. It worked out of sample in many places, many time periods, both back in time and further in time. In other words, in sample periods that we never looked at to begin with, uh, there's evidence going back to the Victorian age and, and UK stocks and uh, uh, Imperial Russia. My, my colleague Will Getzman has some of that. Yep. So we're going to continue to work on it. And I think we're going to work on it from in, in, in two ways. One, what Mark said, which is, um, and, and Ray, Ray's question alluded to, which is different ways of measuring it, different ways of capturing it. But I also think we're, we do need to work on, on the theory. So I'm going to come back to this a little bit. Even if you are an asset manager, the theory can give you some guidance on how to measure it better, right? And and so I agree with Mark that what you ult what you primarily care about is robustness and is it a factor that works? And maybe I agree. Maybe you don't care what state variable it's tied to, and, and I would I would agree with that. Um, but if there is a good story about what the process is driving it, you have a hope of better measuring it. We know how much noise there is in in, in financial market data that that helps you guide. So I I, I see that work continuing. Um, and you know the fact is we don't have that many factors that are that robust. I know there's all this literature out there, Cam Harvey and others, that say there's mm -hmm. three or four hundred factors. At these conferences, we talk about three or four. That's right. it. Uh, again, and and again, if you look again. at a citation weighted right. average of factors people have published, there's three or four, and momentum is one of them. So we'll be talking about it. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, and last word. And 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 under the uh, the idea that you get better answers even if models are wrong, right? I mean, this is like Dan Nelson. Kind of stuff from years yeah, ago. yeah, I think that's right. And I think, you know, model two, you know, for us as humans, this, the way we think about the world is models. Um, you know, I worry about uh, just taking a set of empirical res a set of empirical results as a model two, right? And, um, but the thing that we want to think about is we want to think about regime changes, things like this. And I think we need to try to understand that in the context of a model. Um, you know, it's like the best, the analogy I always give my students is it's kind of like, you know, I, I wanted to come down here to the Marriott Marquis. How do I do that? I look at Google Maps and Google Maps tells me how to go. Now, does it really tell me how to go? Absolutely not. There's a lot of other knowledge, right, that you've built up over the years over, well, when I get off the subway here, you know, I have to watch out for the crazy guy standing outside, things like this. <laughs> and, um, so, but you keep refining that model. And that's our way of organizing all the information that we're presented with in the world and understanding also when there's some behavior out there that just doesn't fit this model and you really better start thinking about, uh, about revising your model, right? And what else would really be driving this? So watch this space. It works. Uh, we may care or not care too much, uh, but we're revising it. It's robust out of yeah. sample and watch this space. Yeah. And I suspect you guys and also people in the audience will continue to strive to do good work on it. Uh, but it looks like we won't solve it anytime soon. Uh, that's good for citations, I think. Uh, <laughs> so uh, please join me in thanking our uh, panelists today. Thank you, guys. Thanks, uh, Mark and, and Toby. It was a, a great discussion.